Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Let's Play. Today we're taking a look at Planet 28, Narrative Skirmish Rules for Miniature Warbands, um, which is a pay what you want uh, miniature war game available on War Games Vault and Drive Through RPG. Now this is a 28, I mean hashtag 28 inspired miniature game where you build, you know, beautifully converted miniature warbands and tell a narrative experience. Now the core rules um, are designed for some versus combat, some one-on-one head-to-head -on -one -head stuff, but you can also get 28 Death on the Periphery, solo and co-op rules for Planet 28 that comes with the micro campaign, um, which we're actually going to play through, which is a Planetary Rebellion Escape from Leicester 7. Uh, you're basically called to try and rescue the Overlord of Leicester 7. He's a high commander. Um, and it's too tempting to pass up, basically. So you try and, try and get this guy away from the workers and mutant workers who are currently tearing the place up. So um, this is designed to sort of apply to any miniatures you want. You should be able to cobble together rules for any model you create uh, and then play through a sort of linked series of missions and experiencing campaign points, getting better, learning new skills, uh, but also, of course, taking wounds and potentially dying along the way. So I'm going to show you the table, show you the mission, uh, run through the core rules as we go, and we'll get this underway. And here they are, Planet 28 and Planet 28 Death in the Periphery, uh, printed off from my home printer. <laughs> These are um, another of my series of sort of like uh, checking out indie micro rule sets. This is not a... Um, uh, what does it say? This is not a rule system that is heavy on rules. It's more heavy on character creation and flavor um, and tries to get you right in the action with some pretty co simple core mechanics. So um, what do you need? Well, you need some models. And I've already converted some stuff up. I, I did the converting first um, for my warband. So in the middle here, we have Inquisitor Absalom Knox. He is the... Um, I don't, I'm not going to say he's crooked, but he's certainly not exactly straight and narrow. As you can see, he's festooned with all kinds of alien technology there. Um, Inquisitor, who is my radical uh, Xenos Inquisitor. I converted this guy ages ago for a little Blanchitsu um, sort of like uh, character conversion contest that we had, and I'd never painted him. And this rule set gave me the example or the reason to paint him. Uh, and then I've got his two retinue that have accompanied him here. This is uh, Fetch. He is a bounty hunter, uh, ex-guardsman bounty hunter. Uh, fetch and doom and then over here we have Oslin who's a pilot um, on uh, the Inquisitor's personal Corvette uh, and also doubles as a marksman and hangs out with him and then we have over here the overlord this is the uh, planetary governor or senior senior official basically who um, Inquisitor Fetch or Inquisitor sorry Fetch and doom is my bounty hunter Inquisitor Absalom uh, is uh, is pretty excited to have in his pocket. Being a radical Inquisitor when you get a distress call and, and you know some kind of rebellion going on and it's not to do with your primary work but it gives you the opportunity to have an Imperial official kind of in your pocket. Well, you, you take the job. Down here, I converted up, well, I didn't really convert up, I just painted up uh, some rebel workers and mutants. These are the old Dark Imperium, no, not Dark Imperium, Dark Vengeance uh, cultists, who are great sort of like corrupted, just sort of like workforce dudes. Well, they're like breathers and stuff and just, you know, carrying auto guns. And these are some of the old fanatic era um, scavy, I think they were supposed to be plague zombies. But they're not really zombie like they're more like mutants and so they made perfect um sort of like mutant workers and stuff uh and they'll start off as workers and then get more mutated of course as the as the the, the rebellion progresses uh and then uh now that i have my models because this was basically the list of models i needed for the campaign stuff these are the ones i wanted to use in my um my campaign i started looking at the core concepts so you need a 20 set of dice, or sorry, full set of D&D &D dice, so 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, and 20 set of dice. Some tape measure in centimeters. Now, if you don't want to use centimeters, it's very easy. 2.5 centimeters is an inch. Um, so even though it says 10 centimeters for Inquisitor Absalom Knox's speed, he moves 4 inches. It's pretty easy to do the math if you don't want to use centimeters. Just pens and paper for printing everything out. Uh, core concepts, you got your characters. They all have three stats, fighting, shooting, and agility. Uh, and then those three stats are used um, typically by rolling underneath. So a 10 is always a fail, a 1 is always a succeed, and you're going to roll a d10 and try and hit under your stat. Uh, you've got your speed, so how far you can move in a single action, your hit points, how much damage you can take before you die. Uh, typically you have 20, but abilities can move those up and down. And then rolling dice. Uh, it's a skill roll is the term for whenever you try and roll equal to or under one of these stats, and it's d10. One always succeeds, ten always fails. Game turn. Each game turn in Planet 28 is composed of a number of turns. Everybody can take two actions in any order, and they can be to move, charge, fight, shoot, ability, item, or hold. So when you do a move, uh, you can go over even, rough, or hazardous terrain. Even is just the ground, it's open. Rough is, like, for instance, moving over an obstacle. Uh, if you move over an obstacle, you gotta make an agility check. If you pass, you count it as being open and even train. If you fail, you move half speed. Hazardous, you make an agility test, uh, and if you pass, you count it as rough terrain, move half speed. If you fail, 
fail, um, then you take D10 damage minus your armor. Let's go roll for every action that you spend in hazardous terrain. Um, so if you continue to climb through, obviously, you gotta test again. And then you can climb. If you do, say, make an agility skill. If they pass, they can climb with the remaining speed and centimeters. If they fail, um, of course, they can't. Uh, a character must use this skill for every action they want to climb. So a character must use both actions to climb a very tall tower. I must make two separate skill rolls. The character ends their movement mid-climb. They must make further skill rolls um, to remain in place until the next turn and can perform any other actions uh, until they finish their failure. You, <laughs> you, you take a point of damage for every two inches you fall, or five centimeters, rather. Sorry, for every centimeter above five centimeters. So for every... Oh, jeez, you have to do the math at that point. <laughs> but for every... Yeah, for, for above two inches, basically, you may take a point of damage for every centimeter that you fall. Uh, characters can't take armor saves against fall damage. And then charging, a character can perform a charge action if they end their move in base contact with an enemy character. You get D, D4 to your fight skill when you fight, and they get a free fight action to do so. Shoot! Uh, characters can shoot any character they can see. Can't shoot if you're locked in combat. A character must not shoot action when locked in combat. A character only use one weapon per action when they shoot. Shoot, you're minus one to your shooter skill for each move action you made before you uh, take your shot, and then minus one if the target is five centimeters or more above the shooter, so shooting at above targets. And then plus one if you're above. The opponents in cover, they get D6 to their armor roll, so they get to add additional to their armor because they're, they're going to take damage, or they're going to absorb damage basically with their cover. And weapons can have special rules and stuff too. You make your armor check, depending on what your armor is, you'll roll a, a dice and then remove that much damage when you take damage. So let's say you take D6 plus 2 damage, and your armor is D12, you take 7 points, but you reduce it by 2 to 5, you only take 5 hit points in damage. You blow 50% of your health, so for most of my guys that'll be 10 hit points. Um, they're minus 1 to all their skill checks. I'm sorry, minus one to all their skills, not their checks. That'd be, that'd be a benefit. Whenever characters reduce below 50%, they have to make a break chest. To do it, they must roll a d10. If they roll below the remaining hit points, they pass and continue to act. If they fail, they must immediately move at full speed towards their sport edge. If they reach the edge before pace, passing a break test, they're removed from the game. Keep using your actions to take break tests until you either succeed, after which you act normally again. Characters below 50 must make a break test every time they take any damage. If characters are to one hit point, they don't need to take a break test anymore. They're too desperate trying to survive. You can fight any character they're engaged with or within five centimeters. Um, so if you're within five centimeters, two inches away, you can fight. First declare which character you wish to attack, then move both characters so that their bases are touching. It's referred to as base contacts. You can kind of snap two if you're within two. Uh, it's reserved, it's uh, resolved in the same manner as shooting. The attacking character must make a skill roll against their fight. And the target character makes any armor rolls and damage is applied to, uh, by rolling the attacker's damage dice. The attacking character fails their skill check, and then you're just both locked in combat. And if the attacker is successful, they can push their opponent directly back three centimeters, in which case the characters are no longer locked in combat. Acted yet, though, you can counter. If the target character is not acted yet, they may choose uh, one of their actions to fight back. If this, um, case both characters must make a skill roll at the same time, each trying to roll under their fight value. If both players succeed, then both characters must make damage. Characters can leave combat going half speed, but their um, opponent can attack uh, for free if they move. Some skills uh, allow you to use an ability, so like um, you use an action to use an ability, you have follow the rules for the ability. Items might be an ability to hold, you can hold an action. A character with a held action can use it at any point during the turn, provide they um, don't interrupt other character actions. Held actions are lost in the turn if they're not used, so you can kind of overwatch if you want to. Core concept, so the, the actual action stuff is pretty simple. And then Warband Creation, everybody starts with a cost of 10 points and these stats. So Shooting 2, Fighting 2, Agility 2, 20 hit points, and Speed of 10. Um, I had 500 points for this campaign to build my Warband. So uh, you can buy additional skill points uh, for 1 point for 10 points per level. Um, and all characters uh, may not have a skill value higher than 10, obviously you can't auto-succeed. You can also buy skills, so like sure-footed, plus 12 points, this character treats rough as even, and dangerous as rough. Climber, this uh, character receives plus 2 their agility when they're doing a climb skill. Fear, this character inspires terror. And I'll go through the ones I picked. So for Inquisitor Nox, um, I upped his fighting by 4, uh, which cost 40 points, and his shooting by 3, which cost 30 points, so 70 points right there, so he's costing 80 points already. And his agility by 3, so he's at 110. Uh, he has 25 hit points um, because of a skill I bought him, which was uh, his power protection not skills item. His power armor gives him bonus hit points. Give him unshakable, so he never has to take break tests, even if he's wounded. He's an inquisitor, obviously. He's not going to run away. Uh, blessed, he's an inquisitor. I thought that was cool. Um, and blessed is when making a skill roll, this character makes uh, 2d10 and keeps the lowest score. So he's better at, better at doing stuff. And then finally, Berserker was his last one I bought him. Um, and that is, this character may never break from combat, and they fight to the death until their opponent flees. So, Berserker actually downed his points by five and let me buy something else. Once he starts fighting, he doesn't leave until somebody's dead. And I mean, that just kind of fit the look of the model.
Zealot, that's what led him to be so crazy. And then he has a heavy pistol, powered blade, and power armor, and those are his um, items. And power armor cost him 50 points. It's 2d10 plus 5 armor, uh, plus 1 to his agility, plus 5 to his hit points. So it actually, sort of part of his agility boost came from um, having his power armor on. And then his power blade, obviously, it's uh, melee and one-handed. Does 2d6 damage, and his, where is it? Heavy uh, heavy pistol, which I thought his like, wrist-mounted gun would be. D10 plus 2, range 25 centimeters, so it will shoot a grand total of... Um, not very far, actually. It's 2 inches every 5 centimeters, so that's going to be... 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. 10 inches. Also one-handed, so obviously it doesn't take both his hands. And Doom the Bounty Hunter, I upped his fighting to 5. He's kind of a brawler, shooting to 4 and agility to 4. He's speed 10 with 20 hit points. He's got fast when he makes a move action. He goes an extra d6 centimeters. He's a climber, because he's got some rope on his belt there, so plus 2 agility. And then a brawler. Um, his bare fists do d4 plus 2 damage. Medium armor, so his armor is d10 plus 3 to shrug damage. He's got a laser rifle, uh, which is range 40 centimeters, so that's going to be, what's 8 times 2? Uh, 16 inches, and it's two hands, so all he can carry, and 2d8 damage. Off the knife, because I gave him Brawler instead. It's the same point cost, but it was cooler because the model wasn't actually armed with a knife to give him a skill that represented how tough he was. Osmond's a lover, not a fighter. He's a pilot, so he's fighting two, shooting five, though, and agility four, uh, and he's got the coward ability. Made him 15 points cheaper, but this character may not charge any other character and must make a break test when charged. Doesn't want to get hit. But he's got light armor for d8 shrug, and then heavy rifle, 16 inch range, d12 plus six damage. So upgrade your weapons with special rules like anti-material or uh, reload, volatile, things that give you, like, um, buy offs for points or make you better. Uh, you can also buy, of course, tons of mystical abilities to make yourself like a space wizard or a psionic or whatever, uh, such as like healing, uh, persuading people, smite, terrify, rend the earth, mind control, withering gaze. Uh, and this lets you customize your characters kind of however you want. Your character can be big, can have a missing limb, iron skin. Like, you can you can model pretty much whatever you can think of uh, and be able to start it up with these rules. The majority of the rules are dedicated to it at that point. Um, when you get to scenarios and playing the game, it's pretty simple. You generate your own game system. Uh, so one of the most important parts is the story. You want to typically have a game master. You get some scenario prompts, so you want to write one. Uh, the game length, so it's going to be D10 plus 6 turns. Uh, so, uh, you know, a fairly long game, basically, potentially. Uh, and then scenery, you want to have at least 60% of the board covered. I think we're, we're covered there with all this beautiful death ray design stuff. And once you set up your playing area, um, number the sides of the playing area 1 to 4, and then each player should roll a d6 in the deployment chart and set up their warband accordingly. And it's basically when you've numbered your deployment. So, 12 centimeters of the playing area would mean that you're 6 inches off. Plot points, you can roll and add cool plot points, like there's a man of the map that's uh, leading to rare treasure, your warband has a highly valuable cargo that you need to take to a wealthy client, all kinds of stuff like that. Finally, there's campaign rules. Should you wish to create a longer storyline that links your games together, you can do so by using the following campaign rules. Uh, all characters receive following points for each game, one point for each successful shoot or fight action, five for each enemy killed, one for surviving the game, five for making it to the end of the game unwounded, uh, and the player that managed to complete their scenario also gets 10 campaign points that can be distributed across the warband. So individuals are in that way, and then the warband can have 10 to distribute. Use your skills by one or your hit points by five for each 20 campaign, rounds you, or 20 campaign points that you spend. Um, and then players may add a new character to the warband for a cost of 10 campaign points, plus the cost of any levels, traits, abilities, or equipment. You can also just straight up buy traits and abilities and skills for that cost in campaign points. Think of those like other points. If you die, you're only injury chart. It's a D6. On a one, you're dead. On a six, you're fully recovered. Other stuff can reduce your stats and make you beat up. That's it. There's the core rules. Nice and simple and easy. When you activate during the course of the turn, it's real simple. It's everybody in descending agility score. So for the warband, uh, Nox would go first, agility five, and then four and four for Osman and Fetch. Uh, and then we'll get into the solo rules. Now, solo rules change this something, because obviously you're not facing a rival warband, and you need to know what the bad guys do. The option to play a co-op as well, uh, in which case the dudes in the table just become like a rogue force, and you try and complete the objective together. Um, you build your warbands for the solo game based on the campaign rules. Uh, enemy warbands are defined by the campaign and typically placed. If you want to make your own campaigns, you should typically make the enemy warband at least 200 points larger than your own. This is the enemy warband can only act in a certain number of ways based on their sort of like AI, whereas you can make choices. Cooperative, they also give you some rules for single character warbands. If you want to play with a single model and have kind of like heroes playing, 
uh, they change the buy cost for certain things. So single character warbands can increase their hit points by five at a cost of 20 points, and single character warbands may take three actions in a single turn rather than two. Single character warbands are immune to all break tests except for those caused by other character traits or abilities. Sequence, the turn, just as normal game of Planet 28, all characters make two actions in each turn. The order in which characters activate is the same as a normal game. However, at the start of each turn, you must roll a d10, and that's the initiative for the bad guys on the table, and they'll all act in that initiative band. So six. So in this case, all of the um, bad guys would go before Nox and his warband, which I just did on command somehow. Uh, <laughs> then all of them would go after them in addition to band one. Enemy actions. So they all will go on a programmed AI. If the enemy character is in combat, they'll continue to fight until they're slain. If the enemy character is not in combat and there's a player controlled character with a line of sight, they'll attempt to shoot or uh, action or use an ability if possible. If shooting action is not possible, the enemy character will have no relevant abilities. They'll uh, we'll move up to their movement speed towards the nearest visible player controlled uh, character. If two characters are equidistant, randomly select one. If a character is not in combat and no player ca uh, controlled characters are visible, the enemy character will move up to their full movement speed towards the furthest board edge from their current location. Extra details, enemy characters will always perform a charge if they can. Uh, they'll always counter in combat if possible. Enemy characters will never push their opponent back after winning a fight. They may not choose to leave combat. They may not hold actions. If an enemy character encounters an obstacle, they roll a d4. On a 2 or less, they'll attempt to continue a straight line when using their agility. On a 3, they'll turn around and move back the way they came until their movement's complete. On a 4, you may decide how the character uses the rest of their movement, so you get to pick. All the campaign points. Enemies do earn campaign points in this, so the enemy bad guys are going to actually get better and learn and gain skills and stuff. In cooperative games, both players shout up any points they have earned and then divide them equally. And then hidden agendas. This is fun. If you're playing a cooperative game, you can roll or even not a cooperative game, you can roll um, and give a model a hidden agenda, but if they don't complete it, or sorry, if they do complete it, they earn, uh, I think it's five campaign points. Uh, if they don't though, they earn one less campaign point for each mission they go on where they haven't done it. It can be things like kill a certain enemy model, uh, blow up a piece of terrain, one of your enemies knows something, <laughs> and you need to correct the situation fast, start of the game. Select the enemy character, you must succeed in defeating that character at least one fight action. If you do, instead of dealing damage, you instead extract the information you need. That's it. So we're ready to set up and play our first mission from Escape from Leicester 7. One of the joys of owning a ship capable of interstellar travel is the number of distress calls you get to listen to as you hop from system to system. War, famine, industrial accidents, alien invasions, you can hear it all from the safety of your pilot seat. Of course, there are those that calls that stand out, those very special distress signals that catch the ears of even the most jaded spacefarer. And the call you just got from Leicester 7 is exactly that kind of call. It's located far from civilization at the very edge of the galaxy. It's an old industrial world. Once the source of every sock, glove, and hat in the sector, now its main export is aggregate as its vast industry hubs are ground up for use uh, on more other more prosperous worlds. Metal and machinery is just being ground up and sent out now because they don't make anything else. Uh, the loss of its industry has caused Leicester 7 no end of problems, but right now the big problem is revolution. It seems that the timely combination of workers uprising and a mutagenic plague has set the populace of Leicester 7 to total civil war. And somewhere along the way, the planetary overlord has gone and got himself kidnapped. Ordinarily, you'd ignore any official distress call because you're an inquisitor and you don't give none. Um, but <laughs> the prospect of claiming a governor's ransom is just too good to miss. With money in your mind, uh, you send back a return signal to the central government letting them know that you're on the way to hell. Leicester 7 is a micro campaign for solo and co-op play. You need to build 500 point warbands. Um, and you also need a selection of miniatures to represent both the rebel rebelling workers and its mutated civilians. Uh, in the next few pages, you get a flowchart for playing and how your performance will affect the campaign. Campaign chart. So, uh, each turn scenario from Fall of Leicester 7 is designed to be played in sequence. We start off with hard landing and we play it as written. And if we win or lose, I'll go through and show you what we do next. Enemy character profiles. So, Escape from Leicester 7 calls for two types of enemy character rebel workers and mutants. The rebel workers are shoot 5, fighting 6, agility 5, 15 hit points, and they move 4 inches a turn. They have power tools for d4 plus 1 damage and crude pistols with a 15 centimeter range, which is, oh geez, six inches, uh, one-handed and D6 damage. So will shrug off D6 uh, minus two damage, uh, and their traits, they're sure-footed. This character treats rough terrain as even terrain, and dangerous as rough, so they're used to the environment we're in. And citizens are shoot two, fight seven, agility four, 20 hit points, about tougher, speed 10. And then they have mutagenic daggers, uh, which are one-handed, uh, D6 plus three damage. Poisonous, though, characters wounded by a weapon take an additional D6 damage for D8 turns. D4 minus one, and mutagenic, any character killed is replaced by another mutant miniature. Selection of these guys right here. So scenario one is called Hard Landing. After sending down a message to let the planetary authorities know you'll be coming to lend them a hand, you receive instruction to land at a spaceport on the outskirts of Leicester 7's capital city of Lear. You've been told that a security escort will meet you once you dock, providing you with fresh supplies and a map of the Lost Overlord. But upon leaving your ship, you're met only by the sound of gunfire. It seems you've flown right into a rebel ambush, and your only hope is to run right through it. 
You must get at least 50% of your warband, so two of my guys, off the uh, airlock before the 10th turn. So here's our entrance airlock over here. The exit airlock is on this side. Brand is deployed within 10 centimeters, so four inches of spaceport airlock mark one, and we must exit mark three. Center calls for seven rebel workers to be set up on the board according to the deployment instructions. They must be up within 10 centimeters of the board point marked two on the map, so within four inches. For a 90 by 90, so three by three foot board, uh, security buildings and supply stations fill up the vast amphitheater. Cargo crates and fuel barrows are scattered about, and some have been formed into makeshift barriers by the rebels who are attempting to claim the port. The game lasts 10 turns. If you succeed in getting to the airlock, your warband meets up with the planetary security forces and is debriefed. If you fail, your friend is forced to hit the streets and look for the planetary overlord with it, the help of the authorities. Here I am all set up. We've got uh, Obslam Knox, Fetch, and of course, um, Ozan, all set up within four of the uh, entryway here. We'll open up the door. We're trying to get across to here by the end of the game. So first things first, we have 10 turns to do this in. Let's see what the initiative on round one is for the bad guys. Seven, they're going first. Bad news, uh, because these two can see. So we'll start close to furthest, this one right here. Uh, it's not in range with its guns, so it's going to move, but we have to see if it wants to cross the obstacle. On a 1 to 4 it does. No, on a 5 6 it backs up. So he's actually going to take a step backwards. He goes 10 centimeters with his movement. And that means 4 inches. So he'll back up. Getting away from it and being like, nope, there's an Inquisitor over there, guys. We don't want to do that. He's done the next one. Does he want to cross trying to get his pistol in range? He does. So he'll just um, make an agility test. The agility on the workers, I believe, is 5. And he'll fail, so he'll go half right. So go two inches forward, and then be out of range for his gun. Again, going four. Next fellow again out of range, what does he want to do? Uh, he wants to cross, so he'll make an agility check. With an agility of four, he'll pass. I think it's four, five, yep. So he'll just pass and go four, and then he'll go four again, because he's not in range of this pistol, and come charging towards us. Next worker is gonna try and advance, and he'll also get to hurt a lot if he passes his agility test. Five or less. He does. These guys are ready to rock and roll, so they'll also go eight. Heading to here. Next row worker can't see, so he's gonna go towards the furthest table edge point. He's actually gonna double back going this way, because um, he can't see anybody, he has no line of fire. So he's gonna go four and then four again, which is an interesting part of the mechanics. It means that these guys are gonna keep me from sneaking around. Smarter than they appear. The next one over here can't see, so he'll also head to the furthest edge, which will be that corner over there, and go eight, and mean that we're Getting, getting ambushed from both sides. And they can't see, we'll do the same thing. So they split in half, they make sure that we can't sneak behind them. And this one kind of stays to center. Wizard Knox gets to go first, he's in or agility five rather. So he's gonna take a move, his speed is 10, so he can go four inches, head to cover, and then he's gonna shoot his heavy pistol. Charge, but he has to end, I think he engages if he gets within two. And in base contact, so he's just gonna take a shot, I think. Five with his heavy pistol, so he's gonna try and shoot that guy with a five or less. Uh, there's nothing in the way, but he moved, but he fumbles and fails anyway. Four or less because of the move action. Four now, we're gonna go with, I think, fetch. For D6 centimeters with the move action, so three, so basically an extra two inches. So he's gonna get to go uh, six inches on his first move to here. He shoots his laser rifle. Uh, he's shooting four. He's fighting five. Does he want to charge instead? No, he'll charge, actually. Uh, he gets an extra D6 again with his move action, because he's fast. Just one inch, or one centimeter, sorry. So it's a half inch, basically. Uh, but well within four. So he's going to fly in. Fight action at plus D4. So plus three to his um, fighting skill. These guys have already activated, so they can't counter. And that means an eight or less to hit with his fists. He's a brawler. Hits is D4 plus two damage. So that's gonna be three, four, five damage. D6 minus two, so no no save there. And that means five of its 15 uh, hit points are gone. 10 less for that little guy. He goes, he'll walk four over to here with his move, and then he'll shoot this next guy in the open. He's shoot five with his heavy rifle, but he moves to so shoot four, four or less, see if he hits. He does, uh, D12 plus six damage. So that's a big chunk of damage there. D12. Uh, 16 damage, save any of it, D6 minus two. Nope, none. Six campaign points for him, because he got one for the hit and five for the kill. One for actually hitting that guy. Round two now, let's see what the initiative for uh, team workers is gonna be. Seven again, oh no, they all go. With the closest over here, uh, he's going to take a swing. Play six, fails. One charges because he can, so he piles in. He's dead if I had to take him off. Uh, and he gets plus D4 to his fight action now. So he gets plus three, so that's gonna be uh, fight 10, unless he rolls a 10, no he hits. D4 plus one damage, so four, five, six. Medium armor is D10 plus three, so does he shrug any of it? 
Uh, six of it, so it shrugs it off. Fetch down. Uh, then it's over here. Whoops, this fella can't see. And for this table, which is over this way, actually. So his first move will be to come around the corner again. He shoots six, so he'll try and climb. On a one or a two, he does. He doesn't. He backs up again. He goes back. He's like, nope, Stone Inquisitor over there. Go over the barricade. <laughs> and then these guys keep going around the corner. So let's end up going eight. Back to here, because it's the furthest table edge. And all of them will go the same way. Try to flank us. Wizard Knox. Well, he can move four, which won't create a charge. Second move will, so he's gonna go in and then charge. Six plus D4 because of the charge action. So plus three, so nine. So just don't roll a fumble. He doesn't. Our blade does two D6 damage. So six damage. Does anybody get shrugged? D6 minus two. Uh, three of it does. You guys got 12 health left. And Fetch decides to pummel that fella uh, with a uh, fight five. Brawler misses. Second attack. Tries again. A second action. Misses. And with everyone in melee, I think... And hearing some noises, I think we're going to head over to here with our first action and here with our second action. Osman. And that's round two. Round three. For the bad guys, the workers say five. So they're going... Agility five, so we'll have to dice off. So for that'll be for Absalom. Uh, he is going. I guess is low still good. Well, tens of fumbles. Let's say low's good. So he'll go first. Take a stab. He's berserk. He can't break off. So he is going to be melee uh, six. Second, the guy's already hit. Crits. Do any special effects? But it's two six damage. Four. Does anybody get blocked? Two of it. So two more. Down to ten. Second attack. Six or less. Misses. He gets a go, so he'll fight back against Inquisitor Knox. Melee of six. Misses. Second attack. Misses, or hits actually. It's D4 plus one damage. Uh, so four damage. Power Armor though is gonna block it all. That's uh, plus five, so he blocks 19 points of damage. It's not for these puny mutants. Time off from getting to his uh, objective, unfortunately. So then the other one's gonna attack into uh, the man legend that is Fetch and Doom. Attack on a six, hits, and it's D4 plus one. Nothing, because uh, he blocks D10 plus three, so he can't even do any damage there. Second attack, hits, D4 plus one. Uh, that's gonna be four damage. Blocks D10 plus three, so he's fine. And plus three, rather. Uh, so they're all done. This little guy, he's gonna go towards the furthest table edge, which will be back over here. Walk out, see bad guys. Does he want to cross this time, or does he want to stay sentrying? I will cross this time. Uh, agility check on a five. Fails, so he just goes two inches and hops the barricade. These guys go, and they're gonna come around the corner now, uh, cause this would be the furthest table edge now. Still range, so just run around, heading towards Osman. Well, buddy, you're in your supper. <laughs> First shot with his heavy rifle. Hits, pretty good with this thing. Uh, so D12 plus six damage. Plus six, uh, so 12 damage. Does anybody get blocked? Uh, three of it, so nine damage. Take the front guy to wounded, and that means that he'll have to make a morale check uh, when he activates next time to see if he runs away. Second shot, he'll wing this guy, hit him. Sure does, 12 plus six again. Uh, 17, and if he get blocked, uh, he blocks three, so that's gonna be 14. He's alive with one hit point. That means he doesn't have to make morale checks. Just fetch two punches. He's looking for a five or less. He misses, and then his second one, he hits. Four plus two damage. He's a brawler, so that's going to be five damage. Does anybody uh, get blocked? Three of it, so two more. He's down to eight. And pain point for the bounty hunter. Four to ten. Oh, it's not looking great. He's getting stuck here at the docks, all these rebel workers charging around. All right, initiative for the rebels. Seven again. Oh my god, I can roll well, nothing but sevens. We're the one fighting Absalom. I don't think you can actually hurt him, because he's in power armor. So it's uh, six or less. Nope, six or less. Yes, and it's D4 plus one. Uh, so five damage, just gets blocked. Crits, there should be some sort of a critical effect, I think, for damage. It does double damage. It does uh, three, f sorry, three damage, uh, double to six. He still blocks 2d10 plus five. Yeah, he blocks it all. And then this little fellow attacking um, Fetch, he misses with his first action and hits with the second one. 2d4 plus one, I've been messing this up the whole time. Uh, four, five, six, I block some though. D10 plus three, uh, five, takes one. Even at 2d4, it there's zero percent chance of hurting this guy. <laughs> if, I doubled the, if I make a rope or I double the damage, I don't think he can hurt him. Okay, I guess the charge, so first action he moves, second action he charges in. 
and then gets plus d4 to his melee stat. Plus d4, plus three, so he's melee of nine. Fighting nine, hits. D4 plus one, uh, three, four, five. So d10 plus three. Block seven of it. These guys, oh sorry, he has to make a, a morale check. Swoon's left. Does he roll under it? He does, so he's okay. So he just runs forward. And these guys run up eight. They don't quite make it in though. And he's got one wound left, which means he will never have to make a break check again. Because he's just staggering. But he's minus one to all of his skills. Wizard Nox, kill this guy. Let's roll two dice picks the best. I forgot, because he's blessed. Let's roll, let's roll actual dice for Nox. He hits, six damage. Does two. Does any get blocked? Uh, none of it, so this guy goes to eight left. I can attack. Does he hit again? Six or less. He does. 2d6 damage. Does six. Is any blocked? One. So five more. Now this guy's wounded. Down to three. Let's murder this guy. <laughs> so he's a uh, melee of five. The first hit with his fists misses. The second one misses. It's you with your heavy rifle, so five or less. Misses, second shot into this wounded guy. Hit, plus six damage. Uh, it's gonna be 15, does he block any? Three of it, 12 damage, he's only got six left, so this guy's pasted. Six campaign points for Osman. Well, this is the turn where you guys really need to go first. So it's turn five, halfway through the game. And let's see what the initiative is. Initiative for the Rebels, seven. Oh my God, they go first again. Osman, you're in trouble. Uh, so this guy's, well, start with ones in melee. So the one attacking Inquisitor Nox who's wounded now, so uh, four or less, or five or less, misses, and misses. I'm attacking Fetch, misses, by 10, and hits on a two. Four plus one, uh, three, six, seven. Doesn't even get blocked, D10 plus three. All of it, and one attacks him, and misses, and then misses. So let's charge, so he'll make it with his first skill, and attack, so plus D4 to his charge action. Uh, he hits with a plus three, so, he has five right now because of his wounded. Goes to four. Sorry, goes to plus three. Goes to eight. Eight or less. Hits. D4 plus one. Oh my god, seven. You got D8 armor. Blocks it all. Can attack on a five now. Misses. Okay, we got him on his second action. So he charges in. Plus D4. Uh, so plus two makes him a s eight or less. And hits. And it's 2D4 plus one. Uh, three, four, five, six. Doesn't even get blocked. D8. Uh, four of it, so two damage. 18 left. Brawl is uh, going poorly. <laughs> so it's our initiative now. Quizzer Absalom going first. Where this guy three wounds left. You hit, I'm on a six. And then it's 2d6 damage. Seven minus d6 minus two. So six, he'll just die. That's six experience for Hex. Or uh, Nox, sorry. He's gonna charge into this one that's already wounded. Try and free up the bounty hunter. D4 to his skill. Uh, so, or just plus one. So he's seven or less. With blast, he hits. D6 damage. Just a hard roll an eight here. Gets six. Is any blocked? None. So he's down to two and he's wounded. Can the bounty hunter finish him off? It's D10. Needs a five or less. He crits. D4 plus two. Does three, four, five. Is any of it blocked? D6 minus two, two of it, so three damage, kills him. Last action, he's gonna punch this uh, last worker, try and get him out of the way. He misses. And we're gonna try and break off, I think. The break test actually when he's charged, uh, which he passes, because he's got 19 wounds left. And then, uh, he could fail it on a 10, actually. And so he's gonna try and break off. Passes, half speed with just two inches, he'll back up to here. And then he's gonna get a free attack, both these guys. He's on a five. It hits, 2d4, uh, so one, two, three, four. He blocks d8, he's okay. On a six, misses. In a second action, he's gonna try and heavy rifle over here. Five or less, misses. That's because he moved actually, so not great. Turn six, okay. Initiative for the workers, not a seven. Why? The, these dice only roll sevens. Well engaged, it'll attack uh, into the man of the legend that is my bounty hunter, fetch and crit him, 2d4, uh, so that's six, seven damage. He blocks d10 plus three, uh, so seven he blocks. Attack on a crit, uh, fumbles. And then charges, and I have to make a break test, and I can't roll, uh, if I roll 10, he'll fail actually. He doesn't, coward. And then uh, d4 to his skill, his skill becomes nine, 10. 
So fumble to miss, he hits, barely. Uh, 2d8 plus one, or sorry, 2d4 plus one, so two, five, six, is any blocked? Seven of it, blocks it all. Attack on a six now, hits, and it's still 2d4. Uh, so that's gonna be seven, eight damage. Blocks four of it, it takes four. He's down to 14. Little guy charges, because he's, even though he's wounded, he's on one wound, so you can't actually fail a morale check. Five or less, uh, sorry, hits on did eight or less, so he does hit. And then it's 2d4 plus one. Does one, two, three. Is that even blocked? Just one. Down two more, down to 12. No! Osman, you're doing so good. That was half health, but he got charged again, so he had to make a morale check, actually, which he'd fail on a, a fumble. No. All right, uh, there's only three bad guys left, and we get to actually activate now. So, Absalom Knox goes first. He'll just charge, because he's a berserker. Bonus D3, D4, sorry, so plus two. So that's gonna be on an eight or less now. First one, and he hits with a two. 2d6 damage. Seven, uh, and he blocked none, so he'll be down to eight left. From half health and wounded, but still pretty badly beat up. What's the secret agenda for him? What's the secret agenda? Let's just do it now. One. Inquisitor, you should always have one. Vendetta. One of the enemies you're facing is an old foe from your past, but after all characters have been deployed, it's like an enemy character. You must kill that character before the game ends. So there was uh, seven of them. What I'll do is I'll just see, I'll number these guys. So, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Which one was the one he wanted to kill? Six, so it's this one. One more attack on a six or less. Blessed, he hits. And it's two to six damage. If he, if he spikes higher, he could kill him. Nine, does he get blocked? Nice two, none, so he kills this guy too. Well, I feel like we gun butt this guy and just try and kill him. <laughs> Fighting two. Uh, no, let's try and break off. Agility minus, agility four. Yeah, agility four. He passes somehow, but both these guys got swings. So he'll move two inches away. The wounded one on a five, misses. For the unwounded one on a six, misses. Like his second action, he just moves again. And he goes forward to here and says, no thank you. Six, oh man. Initiative for the bad guys. Nine, they're even worse. <laughs> Ugh. He's to shoot now, so he's actually gonna fire his pistol for once. His first action, or sorry, actually, they always try and charge if they can. So he will actually try and charge. So he's gonna go six. It's D4 to his... Uh, fighting, so 10, ten nine or less, I guess, hits. Four plus one damage. Uh, one, two, three, and he blocked. Five, he's okay. Action on a six or less, hits. Does two, three, four, five, six damage. He blocks five of it, takes one more down to 11. Almost wounded, oh, and he did have to make a, uh, if I fumble, I fall back. Break chest for getting charged. No, he's fine. This little guy is in range to shoot, but now his target's in melee. <laughs> so there's like, if they're five inches away, I'd be okay, but they're not. So he's gonna go over here and then he's gonna charge. Break test to see if uh, poor old Osmond <laughs> runs. No, he doesn't. D4 to his stat, so eight or less to hit. And he doesn't. It's initiative, uh, Inquisitor has to go first. He needs to start moving. So he's just gonna start walking towards the thing because we have to get off the table. So we're gonna go. We're just leaving our pallet behind. We can break off. We don't. Time, agility test, we pass this time. So we get to walk back two to here. We swing here on a five, hits, uh-oh, 2d4 damage. Uh, that's gonna be four, five, six, seven, eight damage. Blocks two of it, so he goes down six to five, he's wounded. Guys attack. On a six, hits, 2d4 damage, a little seven damage, does he block any? Three of it, four, he's on a one hit point left. So no morale necessary, but he's almost dead. Hunter, finish this guy off. The Inquisitor's not getting his vendetta, because apparently this guy's the Terminator. Get your gun. Uh, Bounty Hunter's got to shoot a four or less, so he'll try and shoot him. Hits, it's 2d8 damage, uh, that's 11. Does he get blocked? He can only block four, so he just dies. Back in the skill, he falls back after the boss, because the boss is paying, and that means the pilot can be expendable. Extra D6, sorry. Extra one centimeter, so I'm half inch. It's just this jabroni left. Uh, so we're on turn seven. What's their initiative? Four, all right. Well, the boss gets to go first now. I'll roll off. We'll have this one, actually it would be a D10. We'll have the two henchmen be the, actually it matters. So for the dude, he gets a one. He goes before both the henchmen. We're losing our pilot. Loser <laughs> goes first, he'll just move, move. Heading eight, because he's gotta get to this doorway. Then the charge happens. Plus D4 to his melee. 
hit plus one, so he's going to be on a seven or less. Hits four plus one, so four that's eight damage, and knocks him out. Osman, you got beat up bad. Pass your morale. You did not, so you would have fled. Figured a free strike anyway, so he failed his skill and the charge happened no matter what. And then second action, this guy's gonna move up four to here. I think that means that there's gonna be a shot taken. So the bounty hunter will take a shot as he goes to fall back, five or less, or four or less, and hits, critical. EA damage does nine damage, any of it blocked, d6 minus two, three of it. So he'll take six. This guy who is the Terminator will go down to nine left, but not be wounded. <laughs> Wounds remain. And then his second action, he's gonna fall back and go plus five centimeters. Uh, so that's gonna be an extra two inches. So he'll go six. So he's just gonna go three and then three again. He's gonna stay in line of sight though, cause he wants to get a fall on him. Turn eight. Oh man, we gotta get to this doorway. All right, so uh, initiative for the last remaining worker, nine, he goes first. Cause of course he does. He walks up his four, he can't charge the second action, so he fires his pistol. Or shooting five or less, uh, there's an intervening terrain, so it's gonna be four or less. Hit. Six damage to the pistol, five. Uh, D10 plus three for his medium armor, so eight, he blocks it all. He says, well, well, sorry, I think you need to, I think we just go. He's gonna go plus two centimeters, so he'll get to go uh, five inches of this first move to here, because otherwise we don't win this mission. And then his second move uh, will be, sorry, another five inches, but the boss just goes his eight. Up to here. So he'll go another five inches. To there. Bring the Inquisitors running to the authorities. Turn nine. Should it for that last dock worker. One, all right, well finally, some good news. They go last. Uh, and that's gonna be a eight inch move for him. So he'll just walk to the edge. He can leave next turn if he wants. Two inches of the bounty hunter. He goes next for four centimeters, so it's an extra two inches, so you go 10 total. Be right next to the boss. Backing up. Little guy, does he go over the obstacle? He does not. He decides to go forward and then back up and wait to get his revenge. Turn 10 happens. Initiative for that dock worker is gonna be five. So he'll go before um, uh, fetch, but everybody leaves through the door. So these guys are gonna leave through the portal and complete their mission. He's off to try and find that pilot. All right, so every successful shooting fight action got us a campaign point, five for every enemy killed, one for surviving the game, and five for making it uh, to the end of the game unwounded. So plus five for uh, uh, survive, sorry, plus six for surviving and being unwounded for the Inquisitor, for surviving for Fesh. And then what happens to my poor pilot, D6, don't be dead. Five, slow heal, the casual will pull through, but not for a while, they can't take part in the next game. So the security forces find him, but he won't be part of mission two. We had 22 campaign points for Inquisitor Knox, 16 for Fetch, and 15 for Osman. I've got 10 I can distribute. So the guy gets away though, and Inquisitor Fetch uh, has to still try and hunt him down as his um, secret objective. And he's gonna get all the campaign points for this mission because he did all the heavy lifting, um, and he managed to uh, hit and wound and kill. So he's got six, he survived seven. I buy him a stat upgrade. We're gonna go for uh, plus one to his fighting ability. So he's fight six now as well. Sim 10, but we'll just say that he gains the uh, aggregate experience from the rest of the group. So we're gonna uh, divide up our extra um, uh, stuff and give a grand total of, I think eight to the Inquisitor for a total of 30 and then uh, two over here to fetch to give him 18. Yeah, I'm gonna buy Bulwark as an ability on the Inquisitor and he's received no charge bonus when I'm fighting him because that just makes sense he's a giant power armored killing machine. Uh, and then I'm gonna use uh, 10 more to increase two stats, to increase one stat and I'll increase his shoot ability to six. So will sit on his, he doesn't quite have the 20 to increase a stat uh, and that means that we are ready for our next game but it's just the bounty hunter. Uh, and the Inquisitor heading off um, for our next mission. Number two is the Overlord. You can choose to set up your warband against any board edge at the start of the game. And that's where we're gonna be going to next game. After making your way from the spaceport, you discover that the planetary Overlord is hiding out in the slums at the city's edge. Hubs of vice and disease, the slums are flooded with refugees fleeing both the rebels and the spreading plague. Careful observation tells you roughly where the Overlord's hiding, but you'll need to go in and grab him in person. And we'll be back with that next mission to rescue the Overlord, the planetary governor, uh, Inquisitor Absalom Knox, and his bounty hunter, Fetch Andum, going deeper into Leicester 7. 
try and get them as the plague grows and the, the horrible mutant hordes swell and all the rebel workers um, continue to foment their sort of like insurrection. Um, and yeah, of course, our pilot will be <laughs> recovered for game three, hopefully, because we'll even get off the planet when all this is said and done. Uh, and yeah, if you want to check these out for yourself, I'll link them below in the video description. You can check out the rules. Uh, and if you want to pitch in for the effort, then feel free. Otherwise, this is a pay what you want kind of thing. And you can grab these rules and try them out for yourself with all of your cool Inquisitor 28 or hashtag 28 projects. So big thanks for watching. We'll see you for more Let's Plays in the future. Till then, I'm Ash. I'll right I hope you enjoyed that video. If you uh, want to support the channel, of course, like and subscribe and hit the little bell below so you get notifications when I post future content. I do post stuff seven days a week. Uh, if you want to support the channel um, further, you can, of course, buy a t-shirt through Spreadshirts, um, buy a measuring gauge or objective markers from Death for Designs. Um, or, of course, most importantly, there is Patreon. Patreon is what makes all this possible. Uh, keeps the lights on, pays for the studio costs, pays for the equipment, model costs, and everything else. And most importantly, um, puts food in my kids' bellies and a roof over their heads. Uh, big thanks to everyone past, future who supported me. Uh, I do this stuff because of you guys, and of course, I will continue doing it as long as I can.